I was born in, the, in this little town called Lapano. This is the main piazza. As a child, I attended school in this building, which used to be the town hall, the municipio. And we used to double classes. So I did first grade in this room here. It was first and fourth grade together, it was in first grade. Then second grade, in that one, it was second and fifth grade together. Then third grade, I was here alone. And fourth grade, in, back into that building. And in fifth grade, uh, they built a new elementary school just outside of town. So it was like a big to do. One advantage of my education here was that since I was like first, was in first grade, and they had also fourth grade, and in second grade, they also had fifth grade in the same class. Basically, I was learning what, was, what they were teaching two grades ahead of time. So by the time I graduated, I was really, I graduated by the time I finished elementary school. Um, I, I had pretty much like a, a, a higher understanding or was more knowledgeable of things because I used to listen to second grade and fifth grade at the same time. Uh, this was the, the, the town hall for a long time. Uh, in fact, one of my uncles was a mayor here uh, in, in, the, in the 30s. Uh, this was where all the activities used to take place. This was the, 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 the cooperativa used to be called. There used to be like a bar, people used to play cards. And uh, we as children uh, used to play hide and seek around here. That is the church, uh, San Giovanni Battista. This is the rear of the church. Uh, we used to play with the Azione Cattolica, we used to play foosball inside there. Uh, this was the heart of the town in those days. Uh, Christmas, uh, New Year's uh, Eve, they used to have a, the bonfire here, you know. And on September the 8th, which is a special day for this town, uh, because in 1908 there was an earthquake and uh, they took out the Madonna out into the middle of the night to to pray and hope that the earthquake would uh, would uh, would stop. So on now since that time, uh, September the 8th, also people come out here at night at midnight from midnight to 3 a.m. and there's also a big bonfire here. And they, my friends, my former schoolmates, tell me that they still manage to maintain that tradition. Uh, I was born in that house down there, the one that looks whitish, and the left side is already fallen apart. I was born there the first eight years of my life. I lived there, and I used to walk. There's a river in between, like a brook, and I used to come to town to go to school. Uh, we moved to the town in 1958, and then we stayed in La Pano until 1963. Uh, my mother emigrated first. Uh, she was called by my older sister, who had emigrated in 53, 54. Uh, so my mother emigrated in 1962. Then in March of 1963, my father emigrated. And uh, I and my brother Mario, who's three years older than I, stayed behind. We were left in charge of two sister-in-laws who were much older. Well, we have two older brothers. So basically for a, over a year, year and, over a year, uh, 
my mom was in the uh, in the Bronx, and then for another four or five months, uh, my father was also in the Bronx, uh, and then we left in 1963. Uh, you know, and then we just became Americans at that time. When I was a child, all that you see back there, except for those three, that group of three houses, was all cultivated. There was almost no houses in the background. All of what you see now has been built in the 80s and the 90s, when the town uh, under, experienced a kind of a economic uh, development and everyone started building uh, in that area and agriculture for all intents and purposes kind of disappeared. People, it's just not, uh, uh, you know, uh, what do you, uh, it, it's not worth you know, cultivating because there's not, not enough of a return. Everyone just works in the city basically at this point. Over the years, uh, starting in the mid 70s, I, every time I came back to Italy to study and whatever in northern Italy, I would come down to Lapano and I would particularly love this place because it gets such a panoramic view. That's the city of Cosenza, which is an ancient city uh, where there was an, an original people here called the Bretti, which are not Greek, there was an, a local population. And my uh, relative, Maggiorino Yusi, tells me that down here, there used to be a, like in, from Roman times, there was a, a, a settlement, uh, which is called Iulia. And uh, we used to go, when we were kids, we used to go uh, and, and play there because our, my mother and everybody used to take us there. And the actual town of Lapano, which you saw before, was actually located a little bit up here, up on the hills here, which now is called San Lorenzo. Uh, over the years, you know, uh, these uh, settlements and these towns sort of move according to various historical vicissitudes. But this panorama is fantastic. On that side, you have the Apennine Mountains, the, the whole big, you know, cordillera that runs through Italy, and beyond that, you have the Tyrrhenian Sea. Uh, and so this is one of the most inspiring place for me every time I come to just take this in. I'm standing in front of uh, the church of Santa Maria dell'Assunta in a small town called Altavilla. It's a village, it's part of Lapano. It's about three kilometers away. Uh, we still see the valley of the Cratis, Lapano. This is a different town called San Pietro in Guarano. Uh, it was in one of those buildings there. I did sixth grade in 1962-63. And then in September of 63, I emigrated uh, to the United States. Uh, the, I have a particular relationship to this part of the world because although I study and I have friends and colleagues in northern Italy, when I come here uh, I'm discovering more and more that this area is very ancient, it even predates the Greeks. Uh, now, what does that mean in terms of who I am? Well, for many, many years I struggled with the idea, am I Italian, am I American, etc. I went through the normal problems in the Bronx, people could not pronounce my name, which was Pietro. They would call me, they couldn't pronounce Pietro, they said Pietro, I became Pedro, Pedro. Pedro, uh, at the end of high school, I was 19, I said, you know what, before going to college, I change, I'm going to change my name to Peter, and I became an American citizen. So I became Peter. Now, over the years, I became an American, but I also have this side to my uh, life. Um, so I then pursued reflection, I studied uh, anthropology, history and philosophy and all, and all of that. Um, eventually, uh, and that's something that's discussed widely in post-colonial studies and, and ethnic studies, uh, an identity is actually something that is forged, that we construct, and it's not something stable. Just like these towns and these, uh, the populations here changed over centuries, in the case of a person, one's identity changes, evolves, uh, becomes something pliable, something that we just decide at one point, I am this. I could never say I am Italian 100% because from the age of 12 I became an adult, a professional, I lived in New York. And maybe I cannot say that I am 100% American, whatever that say, because of my background. So in the last 20 years, I'm an Italian-American. Now what does that mean? 
And traditionally, people associate that with the, the waves of the immigrants, the first, second generation, third generation. But as we know, and as my colleagues have been saying in our seminar, after third, fourth generation, they just have a last name. They have a distant memory. Um, they really don't know anything. And the traditions, even the cooking, even the way people uh, uh, relate to their religion, changes, changes over time. So my view now is on the basis of uh, published material in this field, uh, and we have learned a lot from the people who come uh, from, for instance, from the Caribbean, from Southeast Asia, from the Mediterranean. Uh, a, a concept that has been introduced is the concept of hybridity. If you really think about it, we're all hybrids of sorts. We're all made up of different uh, cultures, different languages, different uh, uh, traditions, cultural traditions, understood culture in all senses, in, in the broadest possible sense. So. Uh, will, uh, let's say, Italian Americans uh, disappear? No, they will become something new, something different. Uh, but you cannot compare an Italian American from the year 2014 to an Italian American from the year 1960 to one from, uh, let's say, the first uh, in, the, in, in the big wave from 1880 to 1915. You had a lot of Italian immigrants, let's say, in, uh, I'm using New York, but this could apply to Boston, Philadelphia, New Orleans. Uh, when their children are born there, they are Natu they are natural, they are American citizens who have this problem of relating to their parents, this and that. So an immigrant from that time, an Italian American from that time, and an Italian American from the 60s and the 70s when I was growing up and studying, to, to someone today in the United States, today we have a lot of Italians who come in to, to the States, but they have a, a, a different uh, uh, um, they're not part of the same social class. Uh, they are professionals, they're investors. Uh, some of them don't even know the history of the traditional Italian Americans. So identity is something that's uh, malleable, something fluid. Um, we, uh, we, uh, we, we take on like an identity, but we always, we cannot make it too rigid. Uh, we have to sort of negotiate it, is the expression that's being used uh, uh, in cultural studies. You negotiate your identity. And uh, so w what does this mean? It means that maybe there, were ne there never existed a pure 100% identity of anything. It's just that at one point we say, well, this is Greek and this is Roman, okay? But you look at history and the relationship between the two was both ways and so you borrow some things then you, uh, you adapt to new things. So where does one finish, end, and the other one begin? It's very difficult to say. And this is something that traditional scholarship has problems with. We would like to say this is chemistry and this is physics. But if you go at the subatomic level, it's very difficult to say what's chemistry and what's physics. So in a way, hybridity and migration in general is something which challenges established categories of thought. And it challenges them, as I wrote in, in, in an essay 10 years ago, and I hope to make a book out of it now, um, migration of people, migration uh, through language, migration through cultures, migration through religions, to adaptation, to transformation, is actually a, in, in something that's more constitutive of the human condition. And it's really a challenge to anyone who would like to have uh, 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 definitions of culture and of people as if they were numbers. This is three, this is five, so three and five are two different numbers. We cannot say that about people's cultures, languages, because we have proof right here. I mean, right below here there was, a, 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 people lived here before Greek and Roman times. They, you know, we, we, and, and, and so things are always shifting, always moving, and we just sort of, uh, in my own book, my own theory is that migrating is the fundamental dimension of the human condition, but every so often people stop, uh, you have a settlement, you raise your children, and then through a number of circumstances, which could be a uh, desire for better, uh, for farming, or an invasion, or an epidemic, or uh, an earthquake, people relocate. This church here, I'm told by our local historian, used to be about 600 yards down the valley. During the time of the Angevins, when they were ruling here, 
there was a, a kind of a partition of land or of property. So the local priest says, we don't want to go to church down there. They tore that down. They took all the blocks, the tufo, and, and they brought it up here. And they built a church here. So uh, it, it, I always have problems with the idea of like two words, origin and authenticity. I think these are more like ideological and political categories and less uh, ontological or, or, or anthropolo anthropological categories. I think uh, cultures like people move, they're fluid, they change, we, we exchange, we interact, and we're always adding something to our being, and we also leave certain things behind, which I think is, is the normal process uh, in human existence. <laughs> Okay, I'm standing here in front of the altar in the church of San Giovanni Battista and originally San Giovanni Battista in Santa Lucia. We were the patron saint of uh, uh, Lapano. Uh, this, uh, the church is a 15th century church and later I will show you the baptistry that uh, the, uh, the found. Uh, this uh, uh, the altar uh, goes back to the 17th century uh, under the, the style, it reflects the school of Rogliano, which used to be famous at that time. It's a late Baroque. Uh, I took my first communion in this church in 1959. Uh, it's the gathering place of the whole community of Lapano uh, since that time. Um, we have, uh, besides the, 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 the baptismal fount, there's a a beautiful uh, 17th century pulpit here, like a loggia style, and there is another uh, altar on the side, which is of the mysteries of the rosary, which we will see in a second. Um, every time I come to my hometown, I come to this church, because um, everyone in my family, everyone in Lapano basically got married here, and they were baptized, and they uh, the funerals. Uh, my own father, when he died in the Bronx, he came back, we brought him back, and we had services in this church. Um, what else can I say? The, one of the things that, uh, uh, when it comes to Italian Americans, when we say rediscover your roots, is uh, in my case, I was born here. Uh, but a lot of my colleagues, a lot of my friends, a lot of uh, my students who say, well, I want to find out where my grandparents came from. Uh, Italy uh, is rich in this kind of artwork, in small towns, uh, and through uh, talking to people, through really studying the art, studying the, the, the tradition, talking to the, uh, the, the, the paisani, as we say, um, they can retrieve and feel that they're part of a long tradition, and they should valorize this, because some of this uh, beauty and some of this uh, uh, um, I should I say historical memory is what gives us we were talking before about identity well this is part of an identity that you can sort of recover you can construct it uh, by going backwards and uh, you can say well where do you come from where do your ancestors come from well this is where I come from you know as we saw before and everyone all the Italian Americans they are 20 million or so that have left Italy, uh, each one of them, uh, if they go back to their hometowns, uh, there's similar uh, structures, similar traditions, uh, which are layered, layered, layers. You know, it's, 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 it's like deep in the sense of like uh, what you can call a, 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 a memory which must be rediscovered and uh, uh, revalued. Um, and it gives you a sense that uh, you come from somewhere, you belong, some, you belong somewhere. Uh, you also sort of honor your ancestors by coming back and seeing exactly where your father, grandfather, grandmothers uh, went to church, where they probably got married, where they, you know, and, and so on. So I think this is a very important part for those who, uh, especially second and third generation, who think they may have lost their roots that's what they should do. They should sort of come back 
and, and, and admire you know, some of this artwork. And uh, I cannot believe that something like this uh, exists in a small town of 400 people. Um, this, is, this is the beauty, the, the wealth of Italy, basically, if you really think about it. In recent times, the last 20, 30 years, uh, uh, Europe uh, and Italy in particular has uh, seen countless immigrants from different parts of the world that want to come to Europe. The reaction, has, uh, the response has not always been uh, very positive. And we, uh, in the United States, who study migration in Italian-American culture, are sort of particularly sensitive to this phenomenon. When we talk with our colleagues in Italy, our friends in Italy, uh, we often remark uh, upon the fact that Italians, in, in to, some, to a large degree, have kind of forgotten the fact that so many left Italy to go abroad. That Italians have been known as a country of immigrants, of which I am one, one of the last ones, but there's many of our students and colleagues who are second, third generation, fourth generation even. Um, and when we speak to the Italians, they seem not to know much about it. We feel that maybe if they would spend more time learning about their own history, they would have maybe developed a different attitude towards how to deal with, their, with the new immigrants from outside of Italy. To this end, uh, the University of Calabria has recently instituted what is basically the first course, university level course in Italy, uh, called Cultura e Letteratura uh, Italiano-Americana, of which I happen to be one of the professors to, uh, uh, for this first uh, seminar, um, after the, uh, this, uh, the, the, the work done by Professor uh, uh, Ganeri uh, and others at the university. The point is that we can remind the Italians of how many of them left. One out of every five Italians has a relative overseas. We all know that if we include second and third generation of um, the immigrants, the emigrants from Italy, there's more Italians abroad than there are in Italy. We feel that this initiative, on the one hand, will quote-unquote educate the Italians about themselves, will make them appreciate what the, the emigrants did once they uh, reached the other side. Now, of course, we're dealing with just with the ones that went to the United States or Canada, but a similar uh, discourse can be done by those who have gone to South America, France, Germany, and so on. This is a, a way of learning from history, bridging the gap, uh, learning from one another's experiences, um, and uh, we, 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 really, we really hope through our work, through these kind of exchanges, through these kind of communications, translations, publishing, conferences, that perhaps we as Italian Americans can make a contribution to, uh, to an understanding of the migration process in general and of the problem of the recent immigrations uh, coming to Italy. Uh, let's not forget that the United States is still the country with the largest number of immigrants and we have an ongoing problem in the United States. We are dealing with these issues daily at the legal level, psychological level, social level, uh, at the academic levels in the schools. We introduce different courses. Well, I believe, I hope that uh, this will happen in Italy as well. And we're very, very grateful to be able to start here in Calabria, which by the way, is the one region in Italy which between 1899 and 1903 lost something between 30 and 35 percent of its population in three years left this region. Uh, so, you know, in absolute numbers, people speak of the Veneto, Sicily, and Campania, but percentage-wise, the one uh, uh, region that has lost, has sent most of its people abroad was Calabria. So, I'm particularly uh, um, uh, interested, concerned, and, 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 and sort of proud to be able to do this, both to, uh, uh, if you allow me to use the word, I am an educator, so after all, to educate my American friends and colleagues, and as well as to remind 
my friends back here that they should really study their own history more, uh, take stock of the fact that Romania had to go abroad and had to start lives elsewhere, and hopefully also because of that, uh, develop a different kind of attitude and politics towards the newcomers who, let's face it, if they are coming from other countries, to Calabria, to Sicily. It's not because they want to come just to, because they want to take away your bread or your job. The first consideration, especially since we are in a church, is that these people were starving or are victims of various kinds of abuse. Uh, if the immigrants are here, it's because elsewhere things are much worse. Um, maybe they're much worse because of, of historical reasons. Maybe because we colonized a lot of these, a lot of these populations in the past. Uh, history is a living thing. If you study it, you realize that perhaps what goes around comes around. So there's probably, you know, uh, but I don't want to get into that. The fact is that we should develop, have a more sen greater sensitivity and study the phenomenon of immigration and immigration, both present and past, seriously as a subject that cuts through several fields, from sociology to psychology to demographics to politics, I would say, to philosophy and to literary studies, for sure.